Welcome to Dental Business Rx. Practice success in 30 minutes or less. Thank you for calling ABC Dental. Are you an in network or participating provider with any PPOs? How about HMOs? Are you involved in any of those or any other severely reduced fee discount plans? Well, if you are and you practice in the U.S., you're not unlike many of your dental colleagues. And if that's the case, you find yourself participating to whatever degree that might be, how would you answer this question? If you could drop all of your plans and get paid your normal full fee for all your services that your practice provides and take home the same or more income, would you do it? I know I'm sorry it's a long question, but would you do it? I'd imagine that i get close to a 100% yes on this one. Sure, there'd be the holdout or two, most likely because they didn't hear the entirety of my question. But all in all, I think we'd agree that this would be a resounding yes for most, if not everybody. Okay, so what if I told you that you could do this? It is absolutely possible. As a matter of fact, I see clients here at MGE doing it regularly. Well, You may hear that, and I imagine, depending on who's listening, I'd get a varying degree of responses. I'd have some people who hear that statement and they think um, they're excited about it. They want to know more. How can I do this? Some others might think I'm being hopeful, maybe naive, or at worst, disingenuous. While other people might hear that statement and go, yeah, Jeff, that sounds great. Maybe you think I'm smoking some illegal substance because, you know, after all, this just can't be done. You know, the PPOs or managed care is just a fact of life. And it's with that in mind that I say this. You absolutely can get out of every plan, go completely fee-for-service, and have a more profitable, rewarding dental practice. I have no doubt it can be done. I've seen it done. This is for real. But, and here's the but, right? The caveat. There always has to be a but. And it's not that big of a deal, but there is a but. While it's not difficult to do this, it takes two things. It takes work and it takes dedication. And that's what I want to talk about in this week's episode. I want to focus on the realistic steps involved with going out of network and creating and maintaining a fee-for-service dental practice. My name is Jeff Bloomberg, and I'm your host. And maybe this is something you've been thinking about for a while. Maybe it's something that's a more recent development. You know, maybe it's time to start dropping some of these plans. Maybe you've had thoughts that, you know, I'd like to, but I just can't. Well, if this is something that you've been seriously considering, uh, I I would point up a couple things to say there's never been a better time to get out than now. It's it's sort of is time. And there's a few reasons. Right now, we have a pretty unique situation economically, you know, between inflation, which started back in September of 2021, and then the, the tight labor market. We have a little bit of a shortage of potential employees. You combine these two things, uh, you know, inflation and the tight labor market, which has in turn inflated labor costs. You're in a situation where it's costing more to do business than it ever has before. So you've got that going on. Then on the other side of that, if you're participating in plans, you know, I've mentioned some of this stuff before, but um, more than one insurance company has actually not not only not changed their levels of reimbursement or allowable fee, they've actually reduced it. I mean, there's one particular provider that I'm thinking of, or carrier rather, that actually sold this to employees as a big win, how they got doctors to take less money so that the fee your, you know, your employees are being charged for a dental procedure just went down. So you're getting paid less. And meanwhile, everything else is costing more. And this has been the case with managed care all along this this next thing I'm going to say, but this is something that's even more accentuated now. If I'm writing off 40 to 50% of whatever it is I'm producing, let's say I'm doing a crown for $800 and my normal fee is $1,400. There's a reason why my normal fee is $1,400. This wasn't just some idea I had one day, hopefully. It's at least in line with the fees in my area. Well, there's a reason things cost what they cost. It's so that you can maintain an adequate level of profitability because profitability isn't just about what you're going to get to take home. You use some of that profit to fuel expansion without having to go into massive debt, right? So things cost what they cost for a reason. 
So if I have an office that's producing, and I know you even probably don't even look at this anymore, but let's say you're collecting, I don't know, but hundred and hundred thousand. You're collecting a hundred thousand a month. And but your production at full fee is one fifty or two hundred. You get what I mean? So you're doing a lot of PPO procedures, and so you're only collecting a hundred thousand. But if you were to have charged all that at a full fee, it would have been one fifty to two hundred. All right. Now what's funny about this is this is something that people used to keep track of. I used to sit down with a client back in 2006 or 8 or 10, and I'd see, you know, if they were involved in a lot of PPOs, I'd have their production statistic and their collection statistic, and they there was a huge gap between the two because of the write-offs. So they were actually charging out, you know, that 1400 for a crown and then writing off the 600 because it was uncollectible because they were a member of a PPO. That was normal before. Well, now we just enter the fee schedules in our software, so we don't even see what we're writing off anymore. You see, but, and, and this is an exercise you can do if, um, you know, you want to feel kind of bad and make sure you have plenty of uh, Jack Daniels nearby if you're going to do it. I'm, I'm not encouraging alcohol consumption, but you get the idea. It, it's, it's something that we don't even look at anymore because we're just charging the PPO fee out. We don't even know what the full fee would have been. But here's the basic problem. There's a reason why things cost what they cost. So if I have an office that at full fee would be producing 150 to 200 and I'm only collecting 100, my entire expense, you know, my line item of expenses, my expense profile, for lack of a better word, what, what it costs to run my practice is what it costs to run a 150000 to 200000 a month practice. If I'm producing, let's just say it's 200000 If I'm producing 200000 a month, maybe I'm only collecting a hundred because of all the write-offs. My expenses are going to be based on a 200000 a month practice between labor costs and supply costs and other material costs and lab costs and everything else, okay? But I'm only collecting 100000 so I end up with a problem. Then, of course, you add to the mix, inflation pops in there, and then those expenses go up, including my labor costs, and now there's even less left over at the end of the month. I have less and less and less profit. So it's not a workable thing long term. And, you know, sometimes I feel – Especially if you've been practicing for a while, it's very easy to get stuck in, you know, in, in the sense of you're in dentistry, this is what you do, you go to work every day, and you're, you're familiar with running a dental business. But I want you to pop out for a second and just look at the general concepts of business itself, because it is a business, all right? It's healthcare, but it is still a business. You're delivering a service, you're getting paid for it, you need to get new customers, you need to manage your business, you need to staff your business. You could say those things apply to every business, whether a person's running a furniture store or providing some form of a service, not, not just professional service, but any kind of a service. So if I have a business, let's say I'm a manufacturing business. All right, well, I have costs associated with manufacturing whatever it is I manufacture. Let's say I manufacture, I don't know, toys, okay? So I manufacture toys. It costs me a certain amount for materials, costs me a certain amount for labor, for my space, um, you know, to maintain administrative staff, my executive staff, my sales force, things like that. I have to market my toys, and then I have to sell my toys. So if I sell my toys at too low of an amount, I don't have enough to necessarily cover all the expenses of making the toys, or I have just enough to cover the expenses of making it, and there's zero profit. Now, again, the person who's most adversely affected by that is the owner, obviously, and any shareholders in the business because there's not a lot of profit. But it's not just that. Profit is what gives you a cushion. Profit is what gives you expansion potential. So you have a business has to be profitable if the business is to be healthy at all. It isn't just all about what the owner earns. You should be earning money, okay? I'm not saying it's wrong, but profit is important for other things other than what the owner gets paid. So you could apply these basic concepts to any business. You have to be able to sell your goods and services at enough of a price to provide for all of your expenses and have some profit. And in the long term, that's very difficult to do when you're participating in a lot of reduced fee plans. It just doesn't work. It's basic math and it's just becoming worse. And the other issue with this is the more and more involved you become with PPOs, because it seems like a good idea at first. You get a lot of people coming in. Everybody has insurance is the idea. So you think, okay, uh, it, it's you know an easy way to get new patients, and it keeps the practice busy. So fine. The more and more, per, you know, the higher the percentage of your practice that becomes plan based, that's PPO based, the more and more trapped you become. Because you know, if if you feel uncomfortable with dropping these, let's say when you're at fifty percent plan patients, what are you going to think you're going to feel like when you're at eighty or ninety? 
the idea of dropping it, you're basically, in your mind, you're throwing away your entire practice. It becomes a bit petrifying. And then what that does is it creates a bit of an apathy about it all. You know, sure, I'd love to drop out of plans and get paid what I'm worth, but yeah, I just can't. It's impossible. So here's here's the good news. You have a few things going for you, regardless of how much PPO involvement you have. So the first thing is this. By statistic, what we've found is the average, uh, when you drop a plan, on average, the average office will lose only 30% of the patients for PPOs. This does not apply to HMOs, okay? Because that's a little bit of a different, you know, thing. PPOs, but specifically with PPOs, when you drop a plan, so you have a thousand patients in that plan, the average patient loss is 30%. You might think that's not good news, but it actually is good news because in a lot of cases, someone thinks, okay, I'm going to get out of plans, so I need to start marketing for a bunch of non-plan patients to replace the plan patients, right? That's the basic logic involved with it. Well, if you've got, I don't know, 5,000 charts, how long is it going to take you to get 5,000 non-plan patients? That's going to take a while. So it seems like this impossible long task. It's really not that because you technically should retain about 70% of these folks. In some cases, I've seen people retain a lot more, but that's the average, okay? So that's the first thing. On average, you only lose 30% of of, of patients from a plan from a PPO when you drop the plan and stop participating, okay? That's the first thing. Second thing is this. If I'm looking at, let's say I lose that 30% of patients, how many patients do I need to replace the patients I lost to keep my revenue or profitability at the same level. Do you see what I mean? So let's say I had a practice that was 100% PPO and I had 2,000 charts. I dropped the plans. I lose 30% of these patients. So I just lost 600 charts. You follow with the math. I hate doing math in a podcast, but I have to here. So I'm now down to 1,400 charts. I had 2,000. They were all planned patients. I dropped the plans. I'm left with 1,400 patients. So how many new patients do I need to go get to replace all these patients I just lost? This is the other piece of good news. Usually next to none. Now, why is that? Well, let let me just throw this out to you. If I have, let's just use some basic math. Let's say I have three patients and they all need a crown. And my plan fee is $800, but my full fee is $1,400. We'll call them patients one, two, and three, okay? They all need a crown for $800. If you do your crown on all three, that's $2,400. But let's say you decide you're going to dump this plan. You're done with this plan. So you lose patient number three. You're left with patients one and two. You lost a third of these patients, which is higher than the average. So now you're left with patients one and two, but patients one and two are going to proceed with the crown at the full fee. That's $1,400 per person. So those two crowns, are 2,800 versus the three crowns at 800 is only 2,400. I actually made more. My material costs were lower. My labor costs were lower and my lab fee was lower and I actually received more income. So this is sort of this weird dynamic that happens. You know, I, I brought this up in other episodes before where for, you know, diagnostic or preventive services, you'll see cases where there's a 50 to 60% write off. So for a full, you know, for bite wings, a pro fee and an, uh, a periodic exam, it's $120 in a plan, whereas full fee is 250 to 260. You see, so you technically could lose quite a few patients and see zero change in your income. Okay. So that's a distinct possibility. So you have number one, you only lose about 30%. Number two, the amount of new patients, how how many patients you're going to need in order to replace the patients that are leaving, if it stays in that 30% realm, is not that bad. In many cases, it's none. I'm not telling you not to get new patients, but it's not like this desperate requirement to make it work in order for you to drop the plan. That's the second piece of good news. The third piece of good news is this. And by good news, you know, when I say good news, I mean, it's something that you can actually control. You can have some influence over. That's why I'm saying these things are good news. These these are things you can do something about and they're not that bad. So the, the, the last piece of good news is this. If you, you, you probably have a lot of patients that you're just not seeing. The average dental practice after five years loses about 
three quarters of the patients that it's seen. So a practice will have 4,000 charts they've seen over the last five years. They'll end up with only 1,000 still left on the schedule. This is something that we regularly experiment with. We'll talk to a doctor, and and this is something you can do yourself. It's a very easy exercise. And we'll say, okay, how many patients have you seen in the last year? So let's say you take a doctor as a real example. I've seen 1,200 patients in the last year. Okay, good. Now, how many of those patients, those 1,200 patients, have a next appointment date that is after today? That's something you can get out of your software, whether it's Dentrix or Eaglesoft or whatever. So get this idea. How many patients have I seen in the last year? Let's say it's 1,200. Good. How many of those patients have an appointment date after today? You know what the average is? About 60%. So they've seen 1,200 patients in the last year and roughly um, 700 have an appointment which means the remaining, you know, almost 500 don't. That is average. That is common. So that means that of 12 people who came into your practice in the last year, five don't have an appointment. Think about that for a second. That's just in a year. If you stretch these numbers to five years, what you'll normally see is 4,000 patients over the last five years, only 1,000 have a future appointment. Where are those 3,000 people? With with these one-year doctors, where are those 500 people? If you were to sell your practice and you'd seen 1,200 patients in the last year, your broker would call all of them active patients, even though 500 of them don't even have their next appointment. So the point I'm making is, yeah, you might have some patients leave the practice when you start dropping plans, but if you actually put a little bit of effort into reactivation to get the patients that are in your charts to show up regularly, because there's usually no activity on this at all, it really wouldn't be that big of a problem. So this is the, the the third piece of good news. We have the fact that only 30% leave. We have the fact that you don't have to do a one-to-one replacement for every patient that leaves because you have this immediate hike in your fees when you start dropping plans. We have the fact that a lot of the patients in your patient base, you're probably not even seeing anyway. So with that in mind, what does it look like getting out of plans? Well, this is where, so here's here's how I want to do this. Every office is different, all right? You might have somebody who's only in, you know, 20% of their practice is plan-based, whereas another is 80 or 90% or 100%. So everybody needs their own customized, I hate to use the word, plan to get out of plans. So there isn't a blanket answer. So here's what I'm going to do. There's two things. One, if you want that customized plan, how do I, what, what sequence should I take? How should I do this? What I suggest you do is a fees and plans analysis, Well, you'll actually talk to a practice management specialist who will find out what's going on uniquely with your situation and give you an idea of how you work your way out. That being said, this is the second thing I want to do is go over, I'm going to give you the basic sequence. So let's say you want to try this on your own or get started on this on your own because we've helped a lot of doctors do this. I'm going to give you a basic sequence. It's the sequence we would follow if I'm helping a doctor work to get out of plants. All right. So obviously this would be modified for, you know, this, the disclaimer, you'd modify this for people's individual situation. But let me give you the basic steps with getting out. So, okay. So let's talk about getting out of plans. Step one is you have to actually want to get out of plans. This can't be something that you think is a cool or a neat idea. This has to be something that you have an actual drive or dedication or desire to do because there's going to be ups and downs as you're dropping plans. And what's going to drive you through those downs is dedication. So if you don't have that dedication, if you don't have that desire, it's not going to work. It's going to be a problem. You're going to start and then you're going to, you know, change course real fast and just stick in them again. And and really that goes back to figuring out what kind of practice you want to have. Because I think one mistake, and I especially see this with docs, doctors, dentists, is is in private practice, is you can get into this frame of mind that you have to be everything to everybody. I want to be a family practice. I want to be a restorative practice. I want to do quadrant dentistry. I want to be able to offer, you know, procedures at an affordable price. I want to be able to do this. I want to do that. I'm not saying that those things are undoable, but you have to figure out what kind of practice do you want to run. If you don't really care and, you know, you you get whatever you get, you do whatever insurance covers and it's not a big deal to you, then you probably are going to have a hard time getting out of plans. You know, if you're worried about what you're charging, here's the one thing I'll say about fees is you might think that all patients care about are fees. I mean, sure, it's part of the consideration, but by survey, it's not the number one issues. More has to do with caring, attentiveness, uh, really addressing their personal concerns. Those are the bit in quality. Those are the bigger deals for patients. There are a percentage of patients where fees are the big thing. 
But if that's what you want to do, like, I mean, look, you'll go around various towns. I remember when I was in Las Vegas, I saw billboards for $699 and $899 implants. You know, $699 implants, $899, it was something like that, a $6 or $899 implants. So, okay, if I'm motivated by price and I don't care who's placing that implant in my body, which I would, um, I'm going to go there. But if that's what you want to do, then fine, then that's what you do. But if you're trying to run a high quality fee for service practice, you know, with great customer service and this and that, you're probably not going to do 899 implants. Do you see? So you can't be everything to everybody. There are going to be pieces of business that you do not get. And that's okay. You know, to give you an idea, and this isn't to self promote, but here at MGE, our power program is 78 days of training, 600 hours of training. Not everybody is up for that. I mean, the results are there to be had if you do it, but not everybody is up to that. So you know what? That's fine. If someone comes along and says, yeah, I want to do your power program, but I want to do it over five years. Well, it doesn't work if you do it over five years. It has to be more intent or intensive than that. So no, can't do it. You can't be everything to everybody. So you have to decide what your office is going to be. What kind of office is it going to be? How do you want to practice? Because that's what we're going to mold your practice after. And that's part of that desire. If you want to have a fee-for-service, you know, high customer service th- office, this is your practice, do high-end restorative dentistry, this is what you want to do, um, then that's what you do. I mean, nothing wrong with having a fee-for-service family practice either, but you have to decide this. So that's sort of where I would start because then that's what's going to give you that drive or desire to bull through this in order to drop these plans. So to start dropping plans, you first need to do a little bit of homework. You need to know how each of these individual plans are impacting your practice. And this is why I say there's work involved in this. This is going to be hours and hours of work. You know, uh, Maybe it was a lot easier to get in. All you do is sign a contract. Um, but it'd be a little bit harder to get out, but Hey, that's life, right? So first thing I would do is I would, you know, you could do this on a spreadsheet, a word doc, however you want to do it. You got to figure out what plans are you actually in? You may not even know you want a list. Okay. So once I get the list of these plans, I'm going to want to know the general fee structure for each. Now I wouldn't sit and grab all your CDT codes and figure out the fees for each or you'll lose your mind. It's going to take too long. Take the five most common procedures you do in the practice. All right, you might want to take some profies and uh, you could take a PA, although that's that's really variable. Maybe profies, bite wings. um, uh, You could take if you do endo, you could take a molar endo, or you could do a three surface composite and a crown. Maybe you do implants, put an implant on there. Whatever it is, right? Your five most common procedures, and you kind of spread them between basic, uh, major, and preventive, right? Five or six. So you take these list of procedures, the the dollar value for each, from each of these plans, and then you have your full fee, okay? Now, the next part's a little bit trickier. So you see where we're at so far. What plans are you in? What's the general fee structure? So you can get a bit of a flavor. Part of this, too, as a business owner is it forces you to confront what is actually going on. One of the things that I found that's a little bit alarming is someone will be in all these plans. They have no idea what these plans are reimbursing. You know, I'll ask them, what is so-and-so plan, such-and-so, at a plan you pay you for this? I have no idea. I have no idea. So meanwhile, you're wondering why you have no money. This is what's going on or why you're having trouble staying competitive with wages because there's no profit left over at the end. This is what's going on. You have to be aware of these things. You're running a business, okay? So we know what plans we're in. We have the general fee structure for these plans. We're only doing a couple procedures, a few procedures so that we're not driving ourselves insane with this huge administrative exercise. You can have your financial coordinator do this or your office manager put this together to you. The next part's a little trickier. Step three we have to figure out how much business we're getting from each, okay? So by business, I mean how many patients are in the system that are a part of that plan. And then the second thing is, what are our revenues from that plan? How many patients in the system belong to that plan is usually pretty easy. Your system can spit it out for you, pretty pretty simple. But how much revenue you're making from each plan might be a little bit more difficult. There is a way of setting it up so it can report on this. That's something you're gonna wanna know because that's gonna have something to do with deciding when you're gonna drop each. All right. So look at where we're at so far. We have our plan list. We have an idea of the fee schedule and how it compares to our full fees. We have an idea of how many patients are in each plan and how much we're making gross revenues from each plan. So now the next step, once I have all this data, the next step is I have to figure out which one am I dropping first. So how am I going to pick that candidate? Well, a lot of it has to do with what I'm comfortable with. It isn't necessarily, let's say I I have 4,000 patients in plans. I have 27 plans with 4,000 patients. And one of those really reimburses poorly, but it's, you know, 
1,200 of my 4,000 patients. So it's a low reimbursing plan, but with a lot of participation. Well, that one might make me a bit nervous to be as my, my first, you know, drop. That might be a bit heavy. So what I might do in that case is let's say, let's say that's my worst reimbursing plan. I might look at the next re- worst reimbursing plan and let's say I've only got, I don't know, 300 patients in that plan. Maybe I'll start there because then I can do this as a little bit of a trial balloon, see how it goes and, you know, work my way through it. I'm going to learn things along the way, especially when I have to start telling patients that we're no longer participating. It's a lot easier with 300 than 1200 people. Uh, and it gives me an, uh, it gives me a little bit of a taste of how this might work. Okay. So that might be the way I do it. I wouldn't necessarily jump into the big one first. I had a client do that once. He was a genius marketer though. He was great. And he, he applied everything he learned from the MGE new patient workshop, which I'll put a link for on the uh, episode webpage. And he went nuts marketing. He dropped all his plans in one month and his practice was like 90% plan. And he had a bunch of HMOs too. And then he started driving in 150 new patients a month, all fee for service. But that way he was a bit extreme. And I told him that at the time, he even blew me away a little bit. You don't have to do that. So let's say I've got 27 plans. My worst reimbursing plan, unfortunately, happens to be the one with the most participation. But the next worst reimbursing one only has 300 patients in it out of my 4,000 charts. I'm probably going to drop that one then, right? That's where I'm going to start. So what am I going to do next? I'm going to look at the contracts for that plan because every plan has different ways or, you know, the contract stipulates how you're supposed to stop participating. And I want to make sure that I dot all my I's and cross all my T's and I do this right. I might have my attorney look at it if I need to, right? And uh, and then I'm going to send out any notifications that I need to send out in order to drop that plan. Now, my next step could be a couple different things. You see where we're at so far. So we've dropped our first plan. We've notified the insurance company. We haven't necessarily notified the patients. The next thing I'm going to do is if I have, let's say, 27 plans and that's 3,700 patients, I might take the ones with the highest level of participation. And this is really – it really depends on how long I plan on being in these is really the big deal here, right? But what I'm going to do probably is is I may or may not work with somebody to help me renegotiate some of the fees. Now, how could I tell if I could renegotiate the fees? There are websites that will give you the average, you know, PPO fee for a certain procedure in your area. And if I'm being paid less than that, I can probably get my fee bumped up to that. It's still a terrible fee, but it's better than what I'm getting paid. Okay. So I could contact one of these fee renegotiation companies and see if they can do anything for me for some of my remaining plans while I'm in the process of dropping or not and just move on and go on with my plan dropping process, right? But that is always an option. You have it there. So we reviewed the contract and we've dumped it. So then the question is, we've dumped our first plan. What do we do with the patients? Now, this is a, I don't want to say the word is controversial, but I've seen people handle this so many different ways. I remember when we first started doing this, we would have our clients send letters to the patients because, you know, we were worried the patients might think that because they weren't participating, that they couldn't see the doctor anymore and blah, blah, blah. But I've had clients that don't send a letter. They drop the plan, and when they call to confirm the patient, they tell them they're no longer participating in the plan, and they confirm the patient. But they they don't do it in such a way that we're no longer persis- participating with the ABC plan. You can't come here. That isn't the flow of the phone call. It's like, oh, by the way, we don't participate with that plan. Of course, you're still a patient or whatever. But and then it depends on whether the insurance will reimburse the doctor or not. If the re- if the insurance won't um, assign benefits, then the patient's going to have to pay, and then the patient's going to get reimbursed. If they will assign benefits you're basically telling the patients it's going to cost a little bit more when they come in, right? So I had a client do that where he had his uh, receptionist just when they confirmed patients, told them they were no longer in the plan. And then they showed up. And in some cases, if somebody really had a big bone to pick about it, they had a problem with it, the doctor gave them the old plan fee for that visit. You know, I've seen it in case, see, this is where it gives you some leeway, right? I had another client tell me, and I'm not, I'm not recommending this, okay? But it was kind of funny. He had a, uh, his normal crown fee was 1400 and he was getting eight something from the plan he was in. He had a patient in there and the patient said, wow, doc, you know, it was for a crown. I thought this, this was like $800 he'd had a crown before. The last time I got a crown done, the doctor's like, yeah, change, you know, I'm no longer participating in this plan. Wow, 800, that's a lot of money. It just seems really high. So the doctor said, well, what do you think is fair? patient said, well, could I pay you 1200 or 1250 Doc said, sure. I'm not advising you to do that, but I want you to just look at what happened there. Number one, the doctor could control his fee, number one, which is cool. Yes, he did charge less, and I'm not advising you to do that. But even at 1250 he was making way more than he was making in the plan, and the patient paid right there, you see? So 
I'm not again, not advising that, but it gave him a heck of a lot more control over what to do. So whether you're going to notify the patients you're no longer in the plan, the problem with the letter is you're not necessarily there. It might be better to do it with a phone call, which is why the first one you drop might be a smaller plan. You see, then you have less people to contact and you might center the contact about around when they're going to actually show up in the office. And if it's a huge problem, give them the plan fee one last time. Most people will stick with you. And like I said, if it's a, the average loss is about 30%. And you've probably experienced this before. Have you ever had a patient leave the practice because you no longer took their insurance, maybe their HMO or whatever, and they went to the HMO office and then they came back and they were willing to pay whatever they had to pay? I guarantee you 90% of the people, if they participated in any of these, have had that experience before. So why did the patient come back? It was obviously cheaper to stay where they were because it's not all about fee, okay? It's not all about fee. So it's just something to keep in mind. Anyway, so whether you can use phone calls or letters or however you want to do this, you do what's real to you. Now, one other thing I would mention here is if you are participating with Delta Dental, that would be the last plan I would drop, regardless of level of participation. That one takes a little bit more fancy footwork just based on like, look, I don't really have a a, a horse in this race, okay? I don't participate with any plans. I'm not a dentist. We're not a dental office. We just have – we have clients that are dentists, so I'm I'm not – looking at this on a regular basis, I'm more of an observer, right? So what have I observed is most of the time you'll drop plan X and plan X is like, whatever, okay, cool. Or they'll beg you to stay and they'll offer you more money, you know, for, for procedures, whatever they do, you drop plan X and that's the end of it. You talk to the patients and some stay and some go. Okay. With Delta, they get a little bit more aggressive about it and they start communicating with your patients and the whole nine in order to make it look like to a degree, in my opinion, this is my opinion, that they no longer can go to your office, even though they, of course, can. But they're, they're obviously not going to get the same financial benefit. But the apparency is I'm not going to – I can't go to your office anymore because you stopped taking Delta, which is, you know, false. We had one client who – it was actually kind of cool what she did. She dropped Delta – And Delta, of course, followed up with the normal letters they sent out to the patients. They do letters, right? And that's the flavor of the letter. I've seen these. And so what she did is sent out a postcard uh, with Delta's color scheme explaining why she dropped Delta. You know, she had to make a choice between providing quality dentistry or, uh, you know, being able to continue to provide quality dentistry. And she couldn't do it at that fee structure. And it worked out well for her. Her practice is, I think, tripled by now. And she is no longer in network. So the point being is you can get inventive with this. You know, again, with Delta, I would suggest if, if you, because it is a little tricky and if you're very involved with Delta, you might want to contact us for that insurance plan analysis and we kind of walk you through it a little bit better. Okay. But again, that would probably be the last one that I would drop. Now, as you're dropping plans, there would also be, and I should have mentioned this earlier, there's two things I would put a focus on. You know, I reminded you that there's probably a lot of patients that are in your patient database that you're just not even seeing. You need to start working to reactivate these folks. And to help with that, I'll put as a download link on here on the MGE reactivation program. It's a series of steps you follow to reactivate patients. Um, you can download it by clicking the link on the episode webpage. One thing I will mention about that, you can always, if you wanted to get an idea of how many inactive patients you have, won't necessarily tell you who's overdue, but it'll tell you how many patients don't have an extra appointment. Look at how many patients you've seen in the last five years, and then look at how many don't have an appointment. There's your inactive patient number, right? Now, some of those people maybe came in last week and don't have an appointment. Well, those are easy to schedule. But there's some people who probably haven't seen you for two, three years, and they should be seeing you. Depending on the number, you might even bring an employee in full-time to do this if it's a big enough number. But that's something you work on, and you get those folks back into the practice. It creates more practice flow. The next thing is you need to just make sure you're getting a good new patient flow. Uh, you should check out the MG New Patient Workshop. I'll put a link for it. It's a workshop that t- the, the average increase is 42% in the new patients from uh, – doing this workshop, but check it out. I would definitely work on those two things because that sort of flanks your your actions to drop plans. You're, you are going to lose some patients, so that way it helps you to replace the patient roster there a little bit. Okay, so you've dropped your first plan. So let things settle out a bit. If we're approaching this conservatively, let things settle out a bit, okay? Might take a little bit. Might You might be satisfied after two, three weeks. You might be satisfied after two, three months. Who knows, okay? Now, what are you doing while you're seeing how this all shakes out? What are you doing? You are looking at the rest of, like, you know, my little example here. I said you had 27 plans, right? We drop one. Let's look at the other 26 now. Now we're picking who is number two that we're going to drop and who's number three. And we're reviewing those contracts and getting all of our data together, right? Because we're going to do this as a sequence. Once we're satisfied with our first plan being dropped, now we're going after plan two, plan three, three and so on. And we just repeat these steps again, okay? Um, 
one question we get about this, especially now with the, the – I hate saying economic situation because it's just weird. I don't know how else to say it, you know, between inflation and, you know, the, the recent banking, is, banking issues and things of that nature. Um, I've been asked, is it a good idea to drop plans now? I think absolutely it's a good idea to drop plans now. And beyond anything, beyond anything, here's the reason why is you have to, you provide a valuable service, okay? You have to be able to control your fees based on the examples I was discussing earlier. If you can't control the fees of your business, that's sort of like business 101. You have to set your prices. I can't imagine being in a situation where I could not set my price. You have to be able to set your price because only you know what it takes to operate your business, okay? So it's something that... um I would do, and I would do it in a way that you're comfortable with, right? Keep in mind, people do see value. You're always going to have people who see that six ninety nine or eight ninety nine implant. There is a, there are some percentage of people that their their primary concern is cost, and that's fine. If that's not how you want to run your practice, those aren't your patients anyway. But ultimately, it comes back to you know when you're running a business, you have to be able to to handle all aspects of the business. You know how to deliver the actual service of your business, but you know how to you have to know how to manage your business, market your business, sell your services, and so on. Otherwise, you end up dependent upon insurance companies. Why do you think PPO has ever got a foothold in the first place? You know, why do you think it ever happened? Because they're guaranteeing you, well, they're not guaranteeing you, but they're putting you on a list. So patients call your office and you consider it to be free, free marketing. Well, if you knew how to market and get, I want you to imagine for a second, if you needed to get 50 more new patients next month, you knew exactly what to do. You just did it. Would you need a PPO? No. So then why is it that you're at a PPO? Because you needed volume, you needed to be busy, you needed to have butts in the seat. So wouldn't it be better to just learn how to do that yourself so that you're not having to pay these exorbitant write-off prices? Because that's essentially what you're doing in order to get patients from a PPL. You know, and I've said this before, I'll say it again. When you're marketing, one of the key metrics you're using when you market is something called acquisition cost. How much did it cost me to get that new client? Right. And how do you figure acquisition cost? You figure out how much the marketing cost, how much the staff involved with acquiring that client cost, and so on right? In your case, we'd say a patient. So if my acquisition cost, let's say when I send out postcards is $350 per patient. So I send out X amount of postcards. And if I were to divide that by the number of patients I get, the amount I spend on those postcards, it comes to 350 per. All right, that's about average for a postcard. But I'm paying that fee once. The next time they come in for services, I'm not, a pl- I'm not having to pay that acquisition fee because I already acquired them. With a PPO, you're paying that acquisition fee every time you see them in write-offs. So instead of doing a $1,400 crown, you're doing an $800 crown. Instead of doing a $300 composite, you're doing a $150 composite. You're paying that fee every time. So wouldn't it be better to learn how to just get patients on your own steam because that's your business? It, doesn't it make sense? Anyway, I'm just a big fan of being able to control my own destiny, as I hope you are. So you went to school to learn how to you know, be a doctor and help people. Maybe they didn't focus on business, but unfortunately, if you have a business, it's something that you need to learn. Otherwise, you're not in the driver's seat. So why not learn how to control your business so as to create the time and focus so you can focus on doing what you love and helping people? Makes your career a heck of a lot more rewarding. All right. Well, that's all about all I have for you this week. I hope that helps. That's the basic steps for getting out of PPOs. It's actually, you know, look, I could try to make it sound fancier than it is, but that really is it. It is that simple. That's what our clients do. Like I said, it may sound easy. It's very easy to write an idea or a series of actions down on a piece of paper. It's harder to do it sometimes, but that's really all there is to it. Um, if you need help with it, like I mentioned, you can check out that insurance plan analysis that we will do with you. It's a free service. Put a link on the episode webpage. I also put the links for the new patient workshop if you want to check that out as well as that free reactivation program. Um, and if you want to find out more about MGE, you can uh, check us out online at mgeonline.com or call us at 800-640-1140. Folks, have a great week. I wish you the best and I'll see you at the next episode.